Okay, we'll continue with lecture three in chapter nine, and we're going to talk a little bit about aggregate supply. So we'll continue to recap from the first part of the the first half of the material of this um, class. We'll look at chapter three. Aggregate supply in the long run was essentially determined by what the um, output that was or, or the inputs that were available so capital and labor so resources and the technology and we held the resources fixed and the technology fixed so well output was fixed and so we have a long run aggregate supply curve that is well basically perfectly inelastic to price and well completely fixed thus this y bar is our full employment level of output or the natural level of output um, at which point the economy's resources are fully employed. Now, in the long run, this makes perfect sense. In the short run, though, we may not always have our output fully or our inputs fully employed. Okay. So if we look at this in the long run, Y bar or this natural rate of output just doesn't fluctuate with price level. Why? Because prices are flexible. And when prices are flexible, the markets can move around, things can change. It's the long run. So we can always fix these imbalances that we have um, with, that creep up within the economy. So structural changes, sectoral shifts, all these different things we've talked about in the past. Well, in the long run, well, we can iron them all out eventually. So if we include aggregate demand, what happens? Well, we end up with an output level of Y1, and, well, aggregate demand simply determines the price level. And to see this, let's have an increase in aggregate demand. What happens? Well, in the long run, all we have is an increase in, out in price level, right? We don't have an increase in output. The idea here is that just because we want more output doesn't mean we can actually make more output. Right? That comes through things like increasing the amount of resources available or increasing our technology. So, one of the things that we want to look at, though, when we turn to aggregate supply in the short run is the fact that, well, sometimes prices are sticky. In other words, in the short run, some of these changes that happen, the economy just doesn't have time to react to. Right? And one of the easiest ways to see this is in the fact that, well, prices can't immediately respond, or at least not all prices can immediately respond to economic changes. Okay. So for now and through Chapter 11, we'll assume that all prices are stuck at a predetermined level. Now, does this make sense? No, not really. But again, even though it's kind of a cheesy assumption, it actually gives us a, a model that has a pretty significant amount of explanatory power. So it's still well worth studying, even though it is a little bit cheesy. All right. Firms are willing to sell as much at that price as the level as their customers are willing to buy. All right. So this is kind of sort of a competitive type assumption. We're assuming essentially that markets behave in a way that's very similar to a purely competitive type environment. And so therefore, the short run aggregate supply curve is, well, horizontal. So we plug, plot out the short run aggregate supply curve. It's horizontal. Why? What's going on? Well, prices are fixed, not output in the short run. So when we have aggregate demand, we see that it intersects the short run aggregate supply curve. And in the short run, what's going on? We have a fixed price level. And aggregate demand allows us to determine output. To see this, let's have an increase in aggregate demand. What happens? Price level stays the same. Why? Because they are sticky, and this is the short run. But what happens? Output increases. Over time, prices gradually become unstuck. All right, the economy is able to react to whatever's changed aggregate demand. And then they either rise or fall in order to come back to that natural level of output or the long run um, aggregate supply curve. So, well, how does that work? Well, let's see here. If in the short run equilibrium, so equilibrium Y, all right, that's short run equilibrium, is greater than the natural rate of output, 
then what's going to happen? Well, prices rise over time and output then the short run equilibrium eventually falls down to a point where it's actually equal to that long run or natural rate of, of output. What happens if the short run equilibrium is below the natural rate of output? Well, prices fall and the opposite happens. Output eventually climbs, the short run equilibrium gets higher and higher and higher until it's equal to the natural rate of output. And if they're equal to one another, then there's really no force pushing price level up or down. And so we see that price level is what links us from this, this gradual change in price level as, as over time prices get unstuck. That's what moves us from the short run period to the long run period. Okay, so short run and long run effects of some policy changes. So let's say we have a change in money supply. All right, so change in money that's greater than zero. So a positive increase in the money supply. Well, in the short run, what's going to happen? Aggregate demand increases. Well, price level stays the same. Why? Because price level prices are sticky in the short run and can't immediately react to the change in monetary policy. And so in the short run, we have an increase in output. And you'll notice now we are above so this equilibrium, short run equilibrium output Y2 is greater than the um, natural rate of output. So what happens? Price level eventually rises until we hit price level 2 where we're at a new long run equilibrium because the long run equilibrium is the intersection of aggregate demand and the long run aggregate supply curve. Okay, so, well, let's, let's take a look at this a little further, and we're going to think about something called shocks. Now, a shock is an exogenous change in aggregate supply or aggregate demand. So you can think of it like this. It's something that we don't have in our model that makes aggregate supply or aggregate demand change. So a monetary policy shock is one example. We just saw one that caused aggregate demand to change. Um, another, uh, another type of shock might be a technology shock. All right. If all of a sudden space aliens came to Earth and gave us replicators like from Star Trek, so we just push a button and out comes whatever we want, right? Well, that would be a major technology shock, and that would increase production. So that would increase aggregate supply. Well, that, that's the same. That's the basic idea: is these exogenous things outside the model that causes aggregate supply and aggregate demand to change. So. Shocks temporarily push the economy away from this full employment level. So if it's a positive shock, it pushes it above the natural rate. If it's a negative shock, it pushes below the natural rate of output. So an example is an exogenous decrease in velocity. Could we find a more esoteric example? Well, I don't know. Let's think about this for a second. What is velocity? Velocity is that turnover rate of money. So that's how fast money changes hands. So the faster money changes hands, what does that mean? The more, um, well, the more liquidity service we get out of um, the monetary portfolio or the money stock, right? So the more money-ish the money stock becomes. So if we had an increase in velocity, that would kind of basically think of like an increase in money supply. And if we have a decrease in velocity, that would, well, kind of look like a decrease in money supply. So if the money supply is held constant, a decrease in velocity means people will be using their money in fewer transactions, causing a decrease in demand for goods and services. So if we hold the money stock, M, constant. A decrease in velocity means M times V goes down, which means we spend less. If prices are fixed, that means that real um, demand or aggregate demand for real goods goes down. So yeah, so a decrease in demand for goods and services. And so what happens? Aggregate demand shifts to the left. Okay, now in the short run, what happens? We have a decrease in output. All right, the equal short run equilibrium output goes down. Price level, however, doesn't change. 
but in the long run, prices become unstuck, and because output is below the natural level of output, what happens? Price level falls, and it falls until we move back to point C, which is a new long run equilibrium. So, a supply shock alters production costs, affects the prices that firms charge. This is also called a price shock, sometimes it's called a cost shock. Okay, so some examples of adverse supply shocks are things like bad weather, things like workers unionizing and negotiating a wage increase. Now you might think, well, wait a minute, that might sound like a good thing, depending on your political persuasion, but from the standpoint of costs, higher wage means higher costs, which, well, is a negative supply shock. Uh, new environmental regulation requiring firms to reduce emissions. This could cause higher costs. All of these things are what we call adverse supply shocks. Now, that's not saying they are bad policy, per se. It could be bad policy or it could be good policy, but Regardless, one of the costs of these types of policies is, well, more than likely, it's going to increase the cost of producing things, which turns out to be what we call an adverse supply shock. All right, so favorable supply shocks, lower costs and prices. So, for example, a technological um, shock. So an increase, uh, an increase in technology, we find a new way of doing things that basically makes it cheaper. Well, that would be a favorable supply shock.